Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. This is Professor Abdul Salam Yasin Taha from the College of Medicine, University of Suleimani, giving a talk on management principles of extremity vascular trauma. You can uh, download this lecture by visiting my YouTube channel, by visiting the website and the, at the bottom of the slide. Uh, vascular trauma of the, of the limbs is a common emergency, both in civil and wartime. It accounts for approximately 1% to 3% of total civilian trauma in various studies. With the worldwide rise in the rate of tourist attacks and high-speed motor vehicle crash, the rate of vascular trauma has increased as well. Throughout the country, our hospitals daily receive such casualties, and all surgeons should get the necessary knowledge and skill to make an early diagnosis and initiate a timely therapy. The management of such injuries is a challenging job to the general surgeon, particularly in developing countries where limited resources make this task even more difficult. The history of management of extremity vascular trauma, the current strategies employed in the management of vascular trauma have been developed over the past century from both civilian and military experience. Mr. Debeke, who was born in 1908 and died at 2008, reported an amputation rate of 72.5% in a review of popliteal artery injuries encountered in the era of First World War. Following the introduction of vascular reconstruction techniques, amputation rates for similar injuries fell to 32% in the Korean War, and by the end of the Vietnam conflict, the amputation rate had fallen again. Nowadays, most major trauma centers report limb salvage rates of 70 to 95% in patients with limb arterial trauma. Etiology. Extremity vascular injuries may result from blunt and penetrating mechanisms. The penetrating injury may be a gunshot, accounting for 70 to 80% of cases, stab wounds, accounting for 5 to 15% of cases, shotgun or pellet injuries, or shrapnel injuries. Blunt trauma accounts for 5 to 10% and may result from a road traffic accident or falling from a height. And always beware of the association of fracture and or dislocations with vascular injuries. Examples include posterior knee dislocation and popliteal artery injury, the supracondylar humeral fracture and brachial artery injury are examples. Iatrogenic vascular injuries account for 5% and they are increasingly encountered with the increase in conventional peripheral angiography and cardiac catheterization. Pathophysiology. The trauma can involve the arteries, veins, or both. Venous injuries may bleed profusely and may be complicated by air embolism, particularly when the central veins are involved. Moreover, the wall of the vein is thin, renders venous injuries difficult to handle. Therefore, 
the seriousness of venous injuries should not be underestimated. Arterial injuries are classified into total transection, partial tear, arterial contusion, false or pseudoaneurysm, and arteriovenous fistula. So this picture shows the different types of arterial injuries. We might have a complete arterial cut or a lateral uh, tear. We may have a compression of the artery by a fractured bone. We might have an arterial contusion. We might have a combination of spasm and arterial contusion. And we might have a false aneurysm or an arteriovenous fistula. External bleeding results from some arterial injuries, such as the complete and partial tear. On the other hand, there is no bleeding from arterial contusion or arteriovenous fistula. Hence, absence of bleeding doesn't exclude a vascular injury. In complete arterial cut, there is a retraction, vasoconstriction, and thrombosis, which can result in the arrest of bleeding after a while. In contrast, vessel retraction in a lateral tear increases the size of the rent or the size of the defect and the amount of the bleeding. One sequelae of a lateral tear is the formation of pseudoaneurysm or the pulsating hematoma. This results from local bleeding into the nearby soft tissues, forming a local hematoma. The outer wall of the hematoma gets organized over time, forming a fibrous wall, while blood flow continues through the artery and preserves the distal pulses. In arterial contusion, there is an intimal damage, subintimal hematoma, and local thrombus formation. The blood flow ceases, although there is no arterial discontinuity. The site of contusion is darkly discolored with a bounding proximal and absent distal pulse. In arteriovenous fistula, an adjacent artery and vein are injured simultaneously, resulting in a short circuiting of blood from the artery to the vein. In this serious injury, there is no bleeding and the blood flow is not interrupted and hence the limb viability is not affected. However, there are two cardinal signs of this injury, namely thrill and brewy, which should be sought by the examining doctor. Otherwise, arteriovenous fistula can be easily missed. Arterial spasm may result from compression of the artery by a piece of fractured bone and usually resolves with a fracture reduction. It should not be mixed with arterial contusion that can similarly follow bone compression, but has a different pathology and treatment. Arterial contusion is a real damage that requires resection of the damaged segment and end-to-end -end anastomosis whereas arterial spasm is usually managed conservatively with a local application of a vasodilator agent such as papaverine, and sometimes by using a Fogarty catheter for dilation. Clinical features. Interruption of arterial blood flow results in acute limb ischemia that is manifested 
by six Ps. Pain, pallor, pulselessness, paresthesia, paralysis, and poikilothermia. Paralysis and paresthesia are ominous signs as they indicate ischemia of skeletal muscles and somatic nerves. Both skeletal muscles and somatic nerves are the most tolerant tissues to ischemia. Loss of muscle softness on palpation, or the so-called woody limb, is a bad sign indicating an irreversible muscle necrosis. The time interval between injury and revascularization of injured limb is an important factor in determining the outcome of repair. Rapid evacuation of the injured patients was the key factor in the successful management of vascular injuries in the Korean and Vietnam military conflicts. A warm limb ischemic time of less than six hours was associated with an amputation rate of 6.7% compared to 33% and limbs with warm ischemia of more than six hours in one series. However, this golden time, six hours, is not rigid. It is influenced by many factors, such as the site of arterial injury, presence of good collaterals, ambient temperature, associated injuries to veins, nerves, and bones, etc. The prerequisite for repairing limb arterial injuries is limb viability. So a viable limb should undergo revascularization regardless of the time factor, while a dead limb should not be revascularized again regardless of the time factor. Acute limb ischemia is considered to exist when Doppler signal in the extremity is absent on multiple attempts after resuscitation, warming, and reduction of fractures. The signs of acute vascular injury are classified into hard and soft signs. Hard signs include pulsatile bleeding, expanding hematoma, absent distal pulses, cold, pale limb, palpable throat and audible bruit, while soft signs include a small hematoma, history of hemorrhage at scene, means history of hemorrhage at the time of trauma or injury, unexplained hypotension, and peripheral nerve deficit. The presence of hard signs of arterial injury is considered an indication of surgery without further investigations. Well, the state of the pulse de deserves some elaboration. A normal pulse may exist despite a significant vascular injury, such as an arteriovenous fistula, false aneurysm, lateral arterial tear, venous injury, an injury to a branch rather than the main artery, and the presence of efficient collaterals. Moreover, a pulse wave may travel through a soft thrombus producing a distal pulse. So we have many conditions in which the distal pulse is, a, is a preserved despite the presence of a significant vascular injury. Majid et al. reported 25% rate of palpable pulses associated with vascular injuries. So one quarter of cases can present with a preserved distal pulses. In contrast, Absent pulse may be due to anatomical variation 
or shock state rather than an arterial injury. Initial management. Although significant vascular injuries may present with no external bleeding, arterial and or venous hemorrhage is an alarm, alarming and serious presentation of most acute vascular injuries. For example, an injury to the common femoral artery may be fatal because hemorrhage control in the field is difficult. Hemostasis. There are different methods of achieving hemostasis in vascular injury. Hemostasis can be achieved by uh, pressure by a digit over the proximal artery, pressure dressing, tourniquet, and clamping of visible bleeders by a vascular clamp if this is feasible. When a tourniquet is used, be cautious of its disadvantages, such as increasing venous bleeding, nerve injuries, and missed tourniquet. Therefore, always report the time of the application of the tourniquet. When these measures fail to stop the bleeding, then operative control is necessary. Associated limb fractures should be stabilized and shock and other bodily injuries, if present, should be dealt with accordingly. Diagnosis. The diagnosis of acute vascular injuries is straightforward in most cases due to the presence of either hard or soft signs mentioned before. Freikberg et al. found that accurate physical examination was highly sensitive and specific in the diagnosis with a negative predictive value of 99%. Physical examination has also been described as the safest diagnostic approach by other authors. Initial physical examination may be normal in 15% of cases with vascular injury. Therefore, repeated examination is essential if the injury is not to be missed. Significant vascular injuries may present with viable limbs, intact distal pulses, and no bleeding, such as the arteriovenous fistula and false aneurysm. Therefore, don't forget to put your hand on the site of the injury, feeling a thrill, and put your stethoscope listening to a brewery. So a thrill and brewery are the two cardinal signs of a fistula. And if you don't look for them uh, deliberately, then you may miss the diagnosis in a patient with a viable limp and a preserved distal pulse with no bleeding. Fractures and or dislocations may be problematic. If you have a case of fracture or dislocation, always ask yourself, is there an associated vascular injury? If doubt still exists after reducing the fracture and or dislocation, then Doppler ultrasonography and or angiography are necessary to make the diagnosis. And if these two techniques are not available or inconclusive, then surgical exploration is mandatory and should not be unnecessarily delayed. A negative, always remember, a negative surgical exploration is by far much better and safer than missing a vascular injury and losing a limb. Diagnostic workup may be needed in doubtful cases. A portable Doppler device can be used to detect a pulse wave when pulse palpation is uncertain. So this, this photograph shows uh, an injured limb in which the distal pulse is 
detected by using a portable uh, Doppler probe when the palpation of the pulse is uncertain. And this technique can be performed even by the nursing staff. In one study done by Hussein et al, Doppler ultrasonography and pressure studies was performed in the diagnosis of vascular injuries in doubtful cases because of non-availability of angiography in the emergency room of their hospital. The injured extremity index is very important uh, parameter. This is similar to the ankle brachial index and is calculated using a manual blood pressure cuff and a continuous wave Doppler. The first step is to determine the pressure at which the arterial Doppler signal occludes in the injured extremity and that is the numerator. Then the cuff and Doppler are moved to the uninjured extremity and occlusion pressure of Doppler signals is recorded and that is the denominator. An injured extremity index more than 0.9 is normal and is highly specific for excluding Uh, extremity vascular injury in the absence of heart signs. Please, I want to remind you, if the time is not enough to complete the lecture, we'll, we can uh, sign, uh, sign, uh, or sign again to complete the lecture, please. Recently, uh, Doplex ultrasonography has emerged as a valuable diagnostic tool for the diagnosis of potential vascular injuries. By, by Noy et al. demonstrated that Doppler ultrasonography is 95% sensitive and 99% specific in identifying vascular injuries. However, this technique is operator dependent and has a limited role in extensive soft tissue injuries and large hematoma. Angiography is very helpful in doubtful cases, providing the patient is hemodynamically stable and it doesn't delay the repair. Carillo et al. and Pauli et al advocated angiography only in stable patients to delineate the site, nature, and extent of injury in cases of multiple pellet injury or multiple fractures. So this is an example of a fracture femur with injury of the femoral artery shown by angiography. Extremity uh, vasoconstriction with shock and hypothermia in young troops may lead to confusing or false positive findings of angiogram. Misner et al. have recommended a combination of physical examination, Doppler arterial pressure measurement, and Doppler ultrasonography as an optimum screening method for potential vascular injury. Exposure of blood vessels. Anatomical knowledge of the vascular system is essential. For every vessel in the body, whether it is in the region of the neck, the thorax, the abdomen, the pelvis, or the extremities, there is one or more approach. Familiarity of the surgeon with these approaches is very important. Faced with a bleeding from a wound in the neck, axilla, groin, etc., the surgeon most likely has no time to go and read about the most suitable approach to isolate and fix the injured vessel. Instead, 
he should know and immediately go through the standard approach. Otherwise, more time and blood would be lost if a wrong approach is chosen, and ultimately the patient may be lost as well. And for the sake of knowledge of exposure of blood vessels, I uh, pay your attention that we have uh, given three lectures about exposure of blood vessels in different regions of the body, and they are published on my YouTube channel. Surgical equipments. A general surgical set together with vascular clamps, dissecting scissor, vascular pins, and a right angle uh, forceps is fair enough to carry out the vascular repair. Other important tools are the Fogarty catheter, polypropylene sutures of five or and six or sizes, they are suitable for most limb uh, vessels, hypernized saline, and vessel loops. Technique of vascular repair. After choosing the approach, proximal and distal control of the injured vessel should be accomplished quickly so that vascular clamps are applied to stop the bleeding. Sharp dissection is done in the perivascular plane using a good pair of scissors and atraumatic vascular pens. The adventitia should be cleared from the artery and the damaged arterial tissue should be excised to finish with completely healthy arterial ends. Fugati catheter of proper size, 6F, for the lower limb arteries and 3F or 4F for the upper limb arteries is passed proximally to dilate the artery and get a good integrated flow. The distal arterial segment is usually retracted and vasoconstricted and may be difficult to be found. Fogarty catheter is passed distally with the balloon uh, deflated as far as we can to retrieve any clots by gradually inflating the balloon and pulling the catheter. This process should be repeated till we get good back bleeding. Avoid damaging the intima by balloon hyperinflation. The goal is the clot, not the intima removal. So don't uh, overinflate or drag too much. Then irrigation of the distal arterial segment is done by hypernized saline using 5,000 international units of unfractioned heparin in 500 ml normal saline. This is important to open the distal circulation and this is called regional anticoagulation. Temporary arterial shunting has been advocated for complex wounds, for which fracture fixation and extensive debridement is required. It may reduce the total ischemic time, amputations, and hospitalizations. However, it requires more dissection and longer operative time. If the gap in the artery is less than three centimeters, then tension-free end-to-end anastomosis is possible. In doing the arterial anastomosis, it's important to gently handle the vessel. Size discrepancy of the vessels can be overcome by the technique of vessel spatulation. However, if there's a greater loss, Grafting is necessary, and the best is the greatest saphenous vein of the uninjured limb. Nearly always in the setting of trauma, the vein appears inside to us too small or, or not adequate due to vasoconstriction or spasm. 
therefore best assessed after hydro distension. We don't prefer the use of synthetic grafts due to financial constraints and the presence of badly contaminated wounds in most of our patients. Prosthetic conduit is acceptable as a last resort in extremities when vein cannot be harvested. Some authors, on the other hand, have reported that the patency and infection rates of autogenous vein and PTFE graft repairs are comparable. What about venous injuries? Venous injuries alone or in association with arterial injuries are better repaired. However, badly injured veins in a hemodynamically unstable patient can be safely ligated. The resultant edema usually resolves with an elastic support and limb elevation. Repair of extremity venous injuries should only be considered in stable patients. Extremity veins that can be ligated routinely and safely are the brachiocephalic, subclavians, and tibials. Okay, so in other body regions, uh, some veins also can be ligated safely, such as the internal and external jugular veins, the infrahepatic IVC, left renal, mesenteric, and internal iliac veins can be similarly managed. Fasciotomy is a very important adjuvant operation in vascular repair and should be used liberally. The main indications for fasciotomy in vascular injuries are compartment syndrome, extensive soft tissue damage, combined arterial and venous injuries, venous ligation, and following repair of late presented arterial injuries. Among many techniques of fasciotomy, the open approach is preferred. We uh, prefer the open approach of fasciotomy as it enables the surgeon to identify the viable tissues, which are healthy looking muscles, which bleed and contract on cutting and stimulation. And at the same time, open fasciotomy enables us to excise the non-viable tissues. Prophylactic distal fasciotomies are to be considered in all patients with a prolonged ischemia time. And in this picture, you can see a demonstration of what we call the two incisions for compartments fasciotomies. A lateral incision and medial incision are made on the lateral or medial aspects of the leg. The lateral incision will allow decompression of the anterior and the lateral compartments of the leg, while the medial incision allows decompression of the superficial and the posterior compartments of the leg. And here you can see pictures of uh, operative photographs of end-to-end -end repair of the superficial femoral artery and a venigraft for brachial artery injury. And here you can see a picture of fasciotomy of the forearm muscles together with repair of injured brachial artery. And as you can see, the wound was uh, partially closed. Complete closure of the wound was performed after two weeks. Vascular injuries associated with fractures need repair of the vessels and reduction and fixation of the fracture. The sequence of repair, vessel or bone first, depends on the individual case. 
if the patient presents late, the priority is for vessel repair. Otherwise, the fracture can be managed first, followed by vascular repair. Well, what are the contraindications for arterial repair? Repair of arterial injury is contraindicated when the limb is frankly dead. Such a limb needs a primary amputation, i.e. amputation without repair. And this is in contradistinction to secondary amputation, which follows unsuccessful vascular repair. It's very important to diagnose a dead limb and avoid its revascularization, as this would result in acute tubular necrosis subsequent to myoglobin release and damage of the kidney. So here, if you give a patient a chance of vascular repair while the uh, limb is already dead, then this is not a chance for life it's actually a chance of death. So, the choice of arterial ligation and primary amputation. Primary amputation or ligation is an uh, acceptable damage control technique when other life-threatening injuries are present. This is especially true for small, more distal arteries and veins. Otherwise, major limb arteries should be repaired. And again, limb arteries that can be ligated routinely are the digital arteries, radial or ulnar, but not both of them. Preserve the ulnar when possible. Brachial artery distal to profunda uh, brachii with adequate Doppler signal at the wrist profound femoris, and branches of subclavian artery. So all these arteries can be ligated safely. Likewise, the external carotid, hepatic, and internal iliac arteries can be dealt with similarly in other body regions. Wound debridement is an essential step in which all devitalized tissues are excised. This is a very important part of the vascular repair. And the arterial repair should be covered by viable tissue. And a drain is advised after securing the hemostasis. Complete primary closure of the wound is carried out in the very clean cases only. Otherwise, partial closure is preferred as the wounds are usually contaminated and carry the risk of infection. What about the mangled extremity, the mangled or the destroyed or the crushed extremity? Mangled extremity refers to a severely injured limb for which attempted salvage would be useless and therefore a primary amputation is a potential outcome. So in this picture, you can see a uh, severely crushed left upper limb in which uh, the chance of uh, a vascular repair is useless and a primary amputation uh, uh, is the only answer. Mangled extremity severity score, MEWS, is one scoring system used to identify such limbs and anticipate their prognosis. There are many scoring systems for the mangled extremity. One of them is the MEWS. As you can see in this uh, uh, scoring system, there are many uh, criteria or many uh, parameters. Each one is given uh, a, a score. For example, if the patient's age is above 50, this is two points. 30 to 50 years, one point less than 30, zero. If the patient has a uh, systolic pressure uh, uh, less than, more than 90, the score is zero. Hypotension transiently, one point, while persistent hypotension is two points. In regard to the pulse, 
when the pulse is reduced or absent, but perfusion is normal, one point. When the limb is pulseless, paresthesia, diminished capillary fill, two points. When the limb is cool, paralyzed, insensate, this is the three points. And then the type of injury, whether low energy, medium energy, or high energy uh, uh, injury, each one is giving a score. So uh, collectively, if the patient has a score of more than seven, then the chance of amputation is very high. So this uh, type of scoring system actually gives the surgeon an idea about the outcome or the likelihood of amputation. So the question, life or the limb, the difficult choice. The choice uh, between primary and secondary amputation in vascular trauma of the extremity may be difficult. Heroic attempts to save the badly injured limb may not succeed. On the other, on the contrary, it may end in secondary amputation and or the death of the patient. So if the surgeon decides on limb salvage, he should anticipate a prolonged hospitalization, increased rate of sepsis, the possibility of the patient's attachment to the limb, and the possibility of poor functional outcome. And therefore, primary amputation sometimes may be life-saving. Postoperatively, there are two complications, bleeding and thrombos thrombosis of the repair are the two potential post-operative complications. And for every vascular surgeon, the most gratifying result after an arterial repair is to feel a strong distal pulse. Palpable pulses obtained in the operating room should remain palpable post-operatively. Pulse changes, even if Doppler signals are, remain, may indicate graft thrombosis and should be investigated. Portable Doppler device is useful for this purpose and the patient may need uh, re-exploration and thrombectomy if graft thrombosis or uh, is suspected. And also the patient may need re-exploration if there is a bleeding. The outcome of vascular repair in extremity vascular trauma is measured by limb salvage rate. Until the Second World War, arterial ligation was the mainstay of treatment at that time with a high amputation rate reaching 49%. But on account of continuous improvements in the trauma care system and formal vascular repair, amputation rate declined to 13% in the Korean and Vietnam uh, conflict. And at the present, extremity vascular injuries are associated with less than 10% amputation rate. Okay, and this is the list of uh, some of the papers used in the preparation of this lecture. And enjoy this nice uh, site of Awari Shar Park in Suleimani. This is the end of our lecture. This is Professor Abdul Salam Yatsin Taha signing off from the College of Medicine, University of Suleimani. And thank you for watching and listening to this lecture.